Theosophical Society to give me this opportunity today to come and meet all of you here and to share some of the teachings that have come to me by associating with great teachers of the East. We are constantly learning. If we are ready to learn, we never stop learning. The only time we stop learning is when we are not willing to learn. If we say we know all that, we stop learning. Sometimes it looks so unfortunate that people who are just on the threshold of a breakthrough in realizing their own self and their own potential block entry into that knowledge by assuming <coughs> that they know all already. In order to avoid that kind of personal catastrophe, it is best that even when you feel you know a lot, to keep the doors of knowledge open and let knowledge flow as it comes without being hindered by any conditioning which your mind has already adopted. We have a very subtle computer built into our heads, which is called the human mind. The computer functions like other computers, will give you the outputs, inferences, conclusions based on the inputs you give to the computer and the logic that is built into it through prior conditioning. But the conditioned mind, although it functions like a computer, is a little different from a computer because it comes in the way of any step that you take to destroy the computer. If you buy a computer from a store and don't like it, you can throw it away. The computer will do nothing. But if you try to throw away this computer called the human mind, it will put up a stiff battle and a real fight to win and to show to you that you cannot vanquish the computer. For its own survival, the human mind has developed a conditioning which is called the misidentification of the human soul. The human being deriving its consciousness from the soul has forgotten that there is a soul and has identified itself with the mind and has begun to consider that the mind is the human being. When I first came to this country to study at one of your universities in the East, at Harvard, I was surprised to be asked the serious question by serious students of consciousness whether there was indeed any difference between the human soul and the human mind. And I heard lectures by serious students of consciousness who would say, well, I am talking of the soul or mind or whatever, as if it didn't matter. Whether you are talking of the human soul or you are talking of the human mind, it didn't matter. When things come to such a pass that it doesn't matter whether you are talking about your soul or your mind, you have sold yourself to the mind. The mind has won that battle because then the mind can take over and say, come on, now follow me. And then you keep on following the mind, losing your own self and your own potential which exists in the human soul. For many years when I talked in this country, I devoted large part of my lecture time to distinguishing between the human mind and the human soul. I will very briefly repeat that story again to tell you that the human mind is not the human soul and that our real self is the soul and not the mind. What is the difference between the mind and the soul? The mind performs three functions in the human body and human personality. Firstly, it picks up sense perceptions from the various sense organs that are fixed in the body 
seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, these perceptions it picks up, interprets them, gives a meaning to them and creates a world of relationships. This part of the mind is called the sensing mind because it senses what is around it. It senses and perceives through sense organized organisms, through sense organs. It gets this information and gives meaning to it. This is sometimes called the lower part of the mind. Then we have the middle part of the mind, which is the most important part of the mind and the one we have to deal with as students of self-realization, as students of exploration of the true nature of the self. And this middle part of the mind is called the thinking and reasoning mind. The thinking and reasoning mind operates ceaselessly, day and night. It operates whether we are awake or asleep. It operates from the time of our birth and does not cease till the time of our death. This part of the mind which thinks continuously, thinks in language, any language. It speaks the language in our head. As a child, it speaks the blah, blah, blah of a child, the syllables that the child hears and gives meaning to. As it grows up, it picks up the language of more organized English, French, German, Spanish, Japanese, Indian, whatever language you speak. It doesn't matter, but it speaks in words of any language and we say these are thoughts passing through our head. And what are these words? These words that the mind speaks are no more than phonetic symbols, sound symbols, which get their meaning from the association of ideas we have with those sounds and other experiences in life. Therefore, it is used to connecting sounds with external experience and it is using this process in a, in a way which we call thinking. Then sometimes it associates images with these thoughts. Whatever you think about, it draws up a picture before itself and you can then see what it is thinking. This capacity of the mind to think results in a continuous activity of a stream of words and images passing through our head. It also performs the allied function of reasoning. Thinking generally goes along with reasoning. What is reasoning? Reasoning is the application of a logic built into the mind by conditioning over past experiences. When we get educated, a logic gets built into this mind. Every interface that this computer has with the world around us gives it a new conditioning, a new logic. The combination of all the logical processes that goes into the mind makes it a reasonable mind, a mind that can reason, a rational mind. Therefore, the thinking process gets attached to the rational process and the mind begins to reason. This reasoning or logic is performed by the mind in two ways, as students of psychology would know or philosophy would know. The logic that the mind applies is of two kinds, the deductive logic and the inductive logic. In the case of the deductive logic, the mind makes a statement in thought and then proceeds to deduce something already contained in that statement. The mind might say, this wall is made of a wooden panel. Therefore, that piece of the wall is also made of wooden panel. This syllogism or this method of rationalizing or, re or reasoning is called the deductive logic of the mind. The other part is called the inductive logic. In the case of the inductive logic, the mind sees part of the premise and induces what could be the whole or what could be beyond what is present in its own statement. In doing so, the mind is left in a state of uncertainty. Now, please mark, the mind 
in using its reasoning and thinking faculty is either not gaining any new knowledge or is gaining knowledge along with a sense of doubt and uncertainty. That is why if you look at your own life, all the uncertainties and doubts that have crept into you have come because of thinking. Nobody has had any doubts till you start thinking about it. The third part of the mind has been referred to as the creative mind. Actually, it creates nothing except new patterns using the same elements of perception that have been picked up by the lower mind, churning sometimes in the same stream of reasoning, which is called the middle mind, and then putting it into new patterns, we say that is creative mind. It creates nothing except some patterns. And yet we believe that the creativity comes from the mind. If you notice, the mind performs these three functions, sensing, thinking and reasoning, and creating only in a framework of time and space, and follows the logic of cause and effect. Sometimes the mind is called as the framework of time, space and causation. That when experience of human beings is framed like that, we call it a mental experience. This is all that the mind does. There is no other function that the human mind performs which cannot be categorized in these three categories I have just mentioned. Then if this is the human mind, what is the human soul? What is the human soul doing all this while? The human soul provides the motive force for everything to work. It is the life principle. It is the vitality. It is consciousness. It is the source of consciousness. If you are not conscious, neither mind nor senses nor body would work. Therefore, the human soul which provides consciousness continuously performs its own functions. There are three functions that the human soul performs which cannot be performed by the mind. The first function of the human soul is to gather intuitive knowledge, intuition, gut feeling, gut knowledge, hunch, that sudden flash which comes from nowhere. It is not logical. It doesn't come in any length of time. It does not come in any particular spot in space. This spaceless, timeless, causeless bit of information or knowledge that flashes into our being, into our consciousness, comes from the soul and it cannot come from the mind. So intuition is a function of the human soul. Second function of the human soul is love. Love is the ability of a human being to identify with another have the same feelings which the other person has, to forget the I and to become the you. This is not possible with the mind. You must have noticed that love is a universal experience because we universally have souls. Having souls, we constantly identify ourselves with others. Then why do we lose that experience of love? Because we start thinking about it. Therefore, the mind has the capacity to destroy the experience of love, but has no capacity to create love which belongs to the human soul. The first function I mentioned, intuition, can also be destroyed by the mind. When an intuitive feeling comes, a gut knowledge comes, we throw it out by thinking about it. That's not possible. That's not logical. Doesn't make sense. It's not rational and we throw out the very basis of true knowledge that comes from our soul. What is the third function of the soul? The third function is the aesthetic function, the ability to experience beauty. When human beings experience beauty, it is a function of their soul, not of their mind. Mind cannot create beauty. You try to contemplate and think about an experience of beauty, you destroy that experience. You look out of the window one morning and see the beautiful layout of nature, the trees and the ponds and the lakes and the blue sky and enjoy something of the totality of that picture. 
gives you a sense of beauty and joy that goes with beauty. Then you start thinking about it. Say, now what is creating this beauty? Start analyzing with your mind. Is it the tree? Is it the color of the tree? The leaves? Is it the blue color? As you keep on analyzing, the beauty becomes less and less. The more you think, you destroy beauty. Imagine, here is a human mind which we have taken as our best friend. Indeed, we think we are that. And that is constantly busy destroying the natural functions of the human soul, the functions of intuition, love and beauty. In the process, we destroy the very basis of a joy and bliss which arises by being ourselves. We are souls. We are automatically in a state of utter joy and happiness. We don't have to learn how to be happy. We don't have to learn how to love. We don't have to learn how to get knowledge. We have to unlearn the mental process which comes in the way of our natural functions. If we stop thinking at this moment, we would have a natural sense of love, beauty, joy, happiness, which would require no learning. But the difficulty is we can't stop thinking. Therefore, we have to deal with the mind in a different way. The most important part is that we must first of all recognize that we are not the mind. If we do not recognize, we cease to be human. We dehumanize ourselves and make ourselves a machine when we think we are the mind. Because the mind functions no better than a machine. Human life, the functions of love, intuition and beauty are not mechanical functions at all. Therefore, they cannot be performed by the human soul when we think we are the human mind. So the potential of the soul is lost because we are in the company of a strange companion sitting right inside our head who keeps on advising us all the time and takes us away from the path of discovery of our own self. All these religious traditions have given the same message. Go within and find out who you are. I was recently in a DR at the headquarters of the Theosophical Society and I went around their big headquarters and saw on the walls of the Theosophical Society headquarters the pictures of all the great religious leaders throughout the world put up there and below the pictures were the messages wherever possible, the original messages of all the leaders, of all the religions. I was first of all surprised that there were so many masters who set up so many religions. But what surprised me most was that the message of all the religious leaders who set up the traditions which led to religions was the same. The message was, be a human being and find your own potential within yourself. Simple message. Every religion said the same thing. The kingdom of God himself is within you. You are within you. Be human. You will find out everything. What is the difference between a human being and animals? The difference is the human being has the ability to take a particular way, a, a path. It has the feeling and experience of a free will no other being has. Those of you who have studied comparative religions, those of you who have studied metaphysics, would realize that free will is a unique experience available only to a human being, next to God himself. All the gods and angels who fly around have no free will because they have all the knowledge of what is going to happen. If you have knowledge what is going to happen tomorrow, if you have knowledge what you will do out of free will tomorrow, you have no free will either. Human beings are blessed in ignorance that they still feel they can decide what they will do tomorrow. And this very feeling of free will distinguishes human beings from everything else created in this universe. The animals go by instinct. They are like machines. 
they go by responses built into the system. If human beings also became instinctive and did not use this free will for a greater evolution of their own souls into a self-realization, they would be no better than animals. Indeed, when you see so many human beings functioning like machines, you wonder where the human being has gone. Somebody asked me, what is the qualification for one to be self-realized, to be God-realized, to find God? What is the qualification? I said the qualification is to be human. If you are really human, you are already divine. If you have the capacity to be a perfect human being, which means you use your free will towards perfection, towards the learning process, towards advancing to greater awareness of your own self, which is a possibility given only to human beings. If you are using your human awareness and will towards that end, you are already a divine person. So a perfect human being is automatically a perfectly divine being. You don't need to go into special divinity. To be divine is not a state of scholarship or learning. You cannot read more and become divine. You cannot listen to more sermons and become divine. Just like you cannot read more books and become human. To be human or divine, you must expand your own awareness into a greater knowledge of your own self, which is your own soul. What an utter mechanical reliance upon our minds dehumanizes us and therefore takes us away from any divinity that is possible. So when you study the history of religions, you find that single message shining out. Be perfect human beings and find the reality of your own creator within yourself. For indeed, there is no creator outside of yourself. That is the message. The message is, if you have to find reality and truth, you will find it within yourself. So go within. It is only those who come in front of us and say, go within, whom we can recognize as truly spiritual beings and spiritual masters. Those who come and draw us out to ritual, ceremony, business, collect collections of funds are not spiritual people. Spiritual people are those who push us back into our own reality within our own selves. A great <clears throat> Indian sage spoke in this country five decades or six, eight decades ago in the World Congress of Religions. I am referring to Swami Vivekananda. When he came and spoke here, he addressed himself to this question. He said the reality is within us. Everything that we see outside is relatively illusion. Looks like real, but is not real. And then he put a very interesting question. He said, I have been telling you all these days, whatever you are seeing around you is unreal. Illusion. That means I must also be illusion, because you are seeing me around yourself. That means my words must also be illusion. That means my message is illusion. How come I am still giving you this message? Knowing that I am illusion, my words are illusion, my message is illusion. And he answered this question himself. He said, it is true. What you see of me as Vivekananda is also illusion. What I am speaking to you is also illusion. My words are illusion. They are not reality. But there is one difference between this untruth or illusion and the rest of the illusion. The rest of the illusion draws you to itself, makes you believe that is real and captures you and captivates you in illusion forever. This illusion, which is also an illusion, hits you back, takes you back into your own self, makes you go back into yourself and find the reality. Both are illusions, but they clash. This illusion gives you the possibility of going back within yourself and finding reality. This is the message of all religions. This is the fundamental message of all spiritual masters, spiritual leaders who ever walked upon this earth. 
I think the Theosophical Society did a great job by collecting this wisdom from different parts of the globe and putting it at one place and showing to mankind there is only one message. Be human, go within and find the truth. Don't get cluttered up on the way with the mind which is a mechanical process. When people try to go within, the mind puts up a battle and does not let you go in. So the old way was how to overcome the mind and people called it the old path. There was no old path, there has always been one path. That still is the path, the path is go within. Where is the old and the new in it? Has anybody found a new path? I heard this was the path right from the beginning of the earth. Go within and find the truth. This is the path. Where is the new path? So this path, go within and find the truth, was given up, thrown away on the way because nobody knew how to go within. There was a lady in a village in India. She was looking for something under the street light in a small village. And a young man passed by and said, Ma'am, have you lost something? Can I help you to find it? She said, Yes, I was sewing something, a piece of garment with my sewing needle and I have dropped the needle. I am looking for that. He said, May I help you to find it? She said, Certainly. So the young man also got down and started looking for the needle. After a while, he said, But ma'am, where exactly did you drop the needle? She said, I dropped the needle in my house. He said, then why are you looking for it out in the street? She said, I have no light in my house. It's dark there. And this is what we started doing. All the messages of all the religions said, go within. The truth is within you. We closed our eyes to go within, found it was dark, so began to go outside to look for the same truth. Are we not doing that? Why are we looking outside? Because inside is dark. Even though the truth lies inside, we must go outside. And we go anywhere outside. I find people going to church, going on pilgrimage, going around the world, going to Himalayas, going to India, going to find the wisdom of the East. They go everywhere except within themselves. And that's where the truth lies. The truth is right with them. They carry the truth all over, looking for that outside. And we laugh over that old lady. That's what we are doing. We are looking for something somewhere else. And so far away we travel. Somebody asked me, tell me some good place where I can go and find the truth. I said, I can tell you a good place, but you cannot go and find. He said, why not? I said, because when you stop going, you reach that place. That place is where you are. If you go, you won't reach it. The trouble is we keep going. We don't stop. Look at the functioning of our human mind, which drags us along. It drags us everywhere. Never stops. We are making visitations. We visit this place and that place. We visit everybody's house except our own. Behind the eyes, inside ourselves, is our own home. We leave that and visit everybody's house, finding out where is our home, we lost it. And we carry our home with us when we do it. It's a strange situation we have placed ourselves in. Why? Because when we close our eyes, it is dark. We cannot see. And yet, every religion, without exception, I am saying, repeating, without exception, says, within yourself shines the light that you cannot even find outside. Some religions went beyond that. They said, lest people think within themselves is in a higher state of consciousness and they don't think this is this body. They went beyond that. The Eastern religion said, only within this body. The physical body, can you find the light that shines beyond the suns and the moons? And the Bible said, When thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. 
they were not talking of some other body, this very body. And those who have tried to go have a little glimpse, a little peep into their own soul within this body, have seen the light, the like of which doesn't exist anywhere else. When those who gave these messages and those who were close to them, they found people keep on forgetting this message that the light is within themselves. They began to build replicas of this great church, the great temple, the temple of the living God, which is the human body. They began to make replicas of this and call them the church and the temple and the mosque and places of worship. And they made domes over it like the top of the head. They made steeples over it like the headgear they wore at that time. They began to give it the same shape and put the candles and the lights and many traditions call those lights the unquenchable flame, the unending flame that it never ends. And those who put candles began to put a large supply of candles to match with the description that the light can never fail. Forgetting that the light that never fails we carry with us all the time. Right on top of our body, in the head. And people who heard the beauty of the music, the word of the Lord within their heads, and they said that word itself is reverberating and resounding in us. When they gave so much credit to it that they thought that was the creator, which indeed it was. And having read the messages of religion, such as the St. John's Gospel starts with, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. All things were made by him. And nothing was made that was not made by him. After reading these things, they said, what is this word that is identified with God as the, and is the maker of all things, including God? What kind of word is this? We go to another tradition. A book much earlier written than the Bible. Written Centuries before that, out of four Vedas, the Rig Veda, which is the our counterpart of the Genesis, it says, in the beginning was the sound. The sound created all that you can see created. You go to another tradition, the Islamic tradition. They said, it is the Bangay Asmani, the sound in the great sky, which created everything. You go to the other tradition, they say it is the music of the spheres. The Greeks called it the music of the spheres. The Logos, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, they use so many words in different traditions, all saying the same thing. There is that great resounding power which is audible, which can be heard. It tolls, that is continuously moving. And that is the basis of all creation. Go, hearken within, listen to it. You will see the light and the sound within yourself. You don't have to go anywhere. What did we do? We forgot. We began to play music and sing and dance outside, forgetting that the eternal music never stops. When these people heard that bells can sound continuously in this temple of the living Lord, which we carry on our heads, we began to put bells in the churches and the temples. In every place of worship in the world, we use the same kind of music and the same kind of light and yet we did not catch the message. How could this light and sound be so universal in every place of worship, in every religion throughout the world? Nobody went inside to see the significance of these symbols. So much were we taken away, taken in by these symbols, we began to invent more symbols, more rituals, more ceremonies, everything to keep us out. And the mind was exceedingly happy because that ensured the survival of the mind. It is only when we overcame these things and went within ourselves and found our own reality that we could overcome the mind. The more we are kept in these external rituals and ceremonies and symbols, the further away we are from our own selves. Therefore, the message was so clear and so simple. Find the truth, the path. Find the light and the real sound. The sound that is not a sound, but the creative sound. The creative resonance 
which sustains the melody of this universe. Find that within yourself. That is the path. Read, go back and read carefully the path expressed by anybody old or new. It's the same path. The path is, the truth is within you and can be recognized by the light and the sound that accompanies it. If you are lost in a forest and you want to go back home, you have nothing on you. How will you go? You are lost in the desert. How will you go? You will look around. It's dark and night. You will say, I can see the lights. That must be some township. Then you may hear some sounds and you will follow. Light and sound has been a guide for human beings even on this earth. People who are lost in darkness have found their way with light and sound. Why can't we use the light and sound to go within ourselves and pierce the darkness that is there? What creates the darkness? Somebody has very well said, there is no darkness but ignorance. When we have knowledge, we get lighted up. What makes the darkness inside us when we close our eyes is that when we close our eyes, we are not inside. We are still trying to peep outside. We are so used to peeping outside, we are unwilling to look inside. This is such a situation that we have forgotten how to turn our attention to ourselves. Our attention continuously flows out to experience in the world outside of this body. Our relationships come from this body. We forget the soul because that's the only awareness we have. We make such simple mistakes like calling our clothes as ourselves. Supposing I were to say, this jacket is Ishwar Puri. Please call it Ishwar Puri. You will laugh at me. But that's what we are doing. When we start calling our bodies with their names as if that is us. Because a body is no more than a garment. We see people wearing the garment and taking it off. We see every day. The cemetery is a full of testimony where we threw away our garments. The whole world from the beginning till now has shown that this garment cannot last. The spirit never dies. We all get this message. The spirit never dies and the garments are thrown away and we are calling the garments by the name of the person whose spirit speaks to us. What greater mistake can we make? There is a simple statement in English which says what is mine cannot be me. It's very simple. What is mine cannot be me. If this is my jacket, it cannot be me. Because it's my jacket, that means I'm using it. So it can't be me. This is my house, so I cannot be the house. I can only use it. Then is it not logical? Is it not valid to say this is my body, therefore it cannot be me. Is it not valid that this is my mind, therefore it cannot be me? Obviously we are using a body, we are using a mind, we are not that which is called the body or the mind. And who are we? We are the ones who are claiming this is my body, this is my mind. That's the consciousness claiming to use these. And yet, when somebody calls me by the name given to my body, I respond as if the whole spirit is called by that name. I make a further mistake. Somebody says, who is this child? I say, that's my son. Incorrectly. The correct statement is, that's my body's son. Which indeed he is. The spirit occupied the body temporarily. The son is a product of the body. And I began to claim he is my son. Therefore, misidentifying myself with my own garments. This is my wife. This is my son. This is my house. They belong to the body, to the cover. The cover that is not going to stay with you. What belongs to you? These things belong to the cover. The entire set of relationships that exist in this world are relationships with the body, physical body. The physical body is not you. Therefore, none of the relationship, none of these people around you, none of the properties around you are yours. 
How can you claim they are yours? When a person dies, that is the first moment of truth. When he finds nothing that he thought was his, goes with him. There was Alexander the Great. He rode over so many countries, ultimately ending up in India. And he made so many children orphans. He made women widows by killing their menfolk on the way in his great conquest of the world. He amassed huge fortune, carried all the jewels laden on his camels and on his horses. And then he died on the way. When he was about to die, he called the doctors and said, take, my health, take all my wealth but restore me to life. They said, we can't do it. It's God's will. He said, what? I collected all this to pay a price. I can't get life and I can't carry them with me. They said, no. They'll be used up by other people now. You are going. He got such a strange sudden shock of knowledge. He decreed that when you bury me in the coffin, please leave a little place so my hand can be stretched out. And even in the grave, keep my hand out. Don't bury it. Bury the rest of me. Let people see that even Alexander the Great went empty-handed. And he was buried like that. He said, nothing goes with us. And I did so much cruelty to amass this kind of wealth and acquisitions. And none of it is mine. Not even my relatives are mine. Not even these people are mine. Not even my kingdom is mine. Not even my wealth is mine. Not even my body is mine. What is mine? What was mine, I gave it no attention. The spirit that is our own, the spirit that is the self, how much attention have we given to it? Have we ever cared for it? What have we done about it? The spirit, the natural function of which is love, intuition, beauty, how much have we cared for it? How much have we practiced love? The path of love is an integral path of going within because it is integral to your realization of your own soul. If we come to know our soul, what will happen? We will know what is love. How much of love have we shared? We are not willing to share at all any love because when you share love, you become somebody else. Love is the capacity to identify with somebody else. Love is not, I love you, therefore do this for me. That's an ego trip. I, I am doing it. I do it for you. I do it for your sake. I am, what have you done for me? I did so much for your sake. This is not love. This is ego. Wherever I asserts itself, it is ego and not love. There are attachments which we have created through our mind. Because the mind cannot love, therefore it finds a substitute in attachment. What is attachment? Growing together, being attracted. When people get attracted to each other, they miscall it, they call it love. It's not love, it's attachment. Attachment gives pain. Because if people come together because of attachment, when they are separated, there is pain. When they are together, there is happiness temporarily. When they separate, there is pain. At best in attachment, they can be together. Only love gives oneness. Attachment gives togetherness. People mistake. They say oneness or togetherness, whatever you call it. Don't you see the difference? In togetherness, the I remains. Look at the number of people who repeat day in and day out, I love you. In every city, in every town of this great country, every day people repeat this. If they don't repeat, they are asked to repeat. You must say. People say, don't you love me? Say, yes, I said yesterday. But today again say, I love you. Why? That old one is written off. That love is gone. And if somebody says, I love you, after five minutes say it again. Why? I want to be sure. What is this kind of love? Keep on saying, I love you, I love you. Now, I have also seen somebody says, I love you. If the you says, I hate you, the first one who loved also says, I also hate you. There it is. Is this love? This is not love. This is attachment. The pain giving attachment. What is love? Love is 
when neither I is known to you, nor love is known to you, only you is known to you. When you can think of nothing but you, you are in love. When you have forgotten yourself in your transposition of your attention to the beloved, to the one you love, when the feelings of the beloved alone are important for you, when that alone concerns you, when you are entirely with the beloved, you are in love. How often have we loved? Have we loved? If we love, we are caring for the spirit. We are caring for something that truly belongs to us. That will truly outlast the end of this body. That will truly outlast the end of this world. If we have that love and we express it by being the other person, then we have truly built something that goes with us even after death. Have we done? Even when the flash of love comes because of nature's gift to our soul to love, we destroy it by using these machines called mind, reasoning, thinking, logic, self-interest, ego, effort, striving, struggle. All these things are attacking the very basis of a natural asset and wealth which we can accumulate, which is called love. How much time have we given to forgetting the I and putting ourselves in the other's place? Somebody says to me, can you say a simple method by which people can experience love? I said, yes. Just become the other person to whom you are talking. Feel you are that other person. Imagine you are that other person. Imagine what he is thinking, he or she is thinking. Imagine what he or she is expecting. Imagine what he or she is finding. Imagine what he or she is like. Become that. You will experience love there and there. But if you say, I love that poor child. I love that poor fellow. I love that poor baby. Very sad. I want to give something. I want to patronize. It's I, I, I. That ego will never let you see love. How can you patronize in love? Therefore, love is the only thing that takes care of our ego. And we don't care for love. How can we say we care for our souls? How can we say we are exploring our own real self? Which consists of nothing but love. Have you heard the statement, God is love? Have you heard the statement, love is God? Those are truths. They are not said just to encourage us to be more loving and kind. They are truths. They are absolute truths. If you can experience love where you have become somebody else which is the object of your love, you have experienced God. You have experienced your inmost self. You have experienced the real nature and function of your own soul. It's so powerful. People say, is there an answer to the problems of this world? Yes, one answer, love. Is there any answer to the violence of this world? Yes, one answer, love. Is there any answer to the individual problems and worries that we have? Yes, one answer, love. Is there any problem, anything, any problem, any difficulty, anything that cannot be surmounted? No, everything can be surmounted. There is nothing known to us which cannot be surmounted with the power of love. And love is natural to us. We go with our mind. We cast the doubts and uncertainties of our mind on others. The others suspect us also. In turn, love is the casualty in the process. People who are using their mind too much are always suspicious, doubtful, uncertain. Always wanting to be sure. Let me be sure. Somebody offers real love. They say, how can I be sure? There must be a catch. There must be something up the sleeve. In some of these lectures, people are giving on love. They say, take a flower and go and give a hug to the one you love. A guy who has not done that in the past, let him take a flower and go to his wife and hug her. He said, what's wrong? What have you been up to today? Why? Because of the mind. The mind will put her on the other track straight away. That is the nature of the mind. You make the best gesture out of love, 
if the mind is being used, it doesn't respond. But if you put yourself in that position, don't worry about the flower, don't worry about the hugging, don't worry about the kissing, don't worry about any of these rituals and external acts, but put yourself in that position and think like that person. The person will come drawn to you as if that person is an angel. Try it. Tomorrow morning, you go out into this world and meet everybody as if you are that person. If you find any bad guy or bad girl in this world, come back and catch my neck because I never found any bad guy or bad girl. Where are they gone? People say this world is full of wicked people. I travel around the world several times. I have been 30, 40 times around this world. Met thousands and thousands of people, all excellent, good, loving people. Full of love. Where are those bad guys? Why do they hide? Do they run away somewhere? Rishwar Puri is coming, let's hide somewhere. No. And how come I meet so many good people? They are all full of smiles, kindness, love. How does it, where does it come from? From their own souls. Fortunately, there is nobody without a soul except the devil. All human beings, when they are human, have a soul and therefore that love and goodness in them. Provided you meet them like human beings with your soul. You meet people with your soul and you meet their soul. The love and soul in you is so powerful. It alone can take care of the ego and mind even of other people. Don't try and teach this to anybody because when you try and teach with your mind, it never works. I had a very interesting experience once, way back 30 years ago, I was lecturing in a college in India, 35 years ago and a, it was a class of all the students and professors assembled and they asked me to speak on the nature of the self. For the benefit of scientific community, I went so deeply as to tell them of the latest experiments that were going on in which they were able to weigh the weight of an astral body. And when the physical body dies, the life principle that goes has a weight. And even if it's fully enclosed, with no air or anything escaping, even then there is a loss of weight. And so on. I went deep into these questions of the self. And taking them ultimately to the real self, which is beyond senses, beyond mind, even beyond the soul. The totality of the soul, the oneness of consciousness, which alone is our real self. When I took them to that, they were so overwhelmed that one young boy, a student got up and he said, Sir, tell me, how much of all that you told us today is from your own experience and how much of it have you read in the books? And I answered him. I said, young man, Whatever I said that went straight into your heart and made an impact there was from my experience. The rest was from books. That's what books can teach us. Books can teach us scholarship, words, new words, new phrases, make us great scholars and able to write more books. Books cannot give us love. Books cannot give us intuition. Books cannot give us the knowledge of our own self. Books cannot give us the true spiritual experience. Indeed, the intellect that gets so developed by scholarship becomes a stumbling block to our discovering our own self. Therefore, if you find people having difficulty in finding and retaining love, ask them, are they reading too many books? One man from Boston, from Harvard came to Philadelphia the other day when I was speaking at the Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship. And he said, give me a shortcut. I am too much engrossed in all this. I have read this book and I have read this book and I read that and I read all the Krishnamurtis and I read these people. I read all the Western philosophers. I read Charles Sanders Pierce and I read 10 volumes of that. I heard him and he said, but I have got nothing. What is the answer? I said, I will give you a real shortcut. Tonight go pack up all your books and cases and dump them into the river Thames. Go and throw them into the river. From tomorrow, you will start improving. 
the books are the stumbling block for you because they are only putting more and more of the intellectual apparatus the concepts in front of you do you know the concept can never be reality any concept i'm not talking of a particular spiritual concept a concept is different from the real thing that's why it's called concept either it precedes or succeeds the real thing it cannot be the thing and what are these people banking on we know it because we have a clear concept of it we know our soul we have a concept of it how can you know soul if you have a concept of it concept is an intellectual process it's a mental process that blocks you from the experience which need not be rational at all the true spiritual experience of your own self transcends reason it is not bound and bottled by these logical frameworks it does not follow cause and effect how can you have concepts and still expect to overcome it concepts are not an aid to realization concepts are a handicap an obstacle a blockade to realization concepts are an aid to understanding concepts are not an aid to experience understanding has a very strange role in self realization if you want to find yourself use the intellect use effort i had a strange meeting with a very successful spiritual master in india somebody went to him and he said i am reading these books and going through this process master tell me am i right he said yes read how many books have you read the 10 how many more do you have 12 so finish those 12 then get some more read those also ultimately i began to question why are you making them read he says these people will never take the next step unless they have exhausted their mind intellect is such a thing it will not stop interfering in the course of the path towards the self unless it says i give up therefore drive your intellect to such strenuous effort that drive it into a corner against the wall when the intellect says no more it's beyond me i can't do a thing this is not intellectual this is beyond the intellect that's the step next step okay now come back to the path of effortlessness the path of love the path of realization the path of being somebody else the path of transformation in which you don't have to put any effort at all but you will not accept what is effortlessness unless you have found the futility of effort the mind is so crafty you can use any argument it will bring in the element of effort unless effort has been exhausted i know people hear effortless meditation they hear about it effortless meditation and i saw some serious students of meditation coming to me they said we are now going to try very hard for effortless meditation <laughs> that's what the mind does we're going to try very hard we are going to kick this dog out of this hall because it came in and we catch the tail of the dog and hit it get out get out how will the dog get out we are holding on to the tail of the very dog the very mind we are trying to overcome and get rid of is the one we are employing to get rid of the very mental wall which we have to scale we are putting more bricks on it and making it higher to jump over it what are we doing how can the mind help you to overcome the mind doesn't happen that way so exhaust the mind the path the spiritual path indicates that you must go through the process of effort struggle absolutely cornering yourself understanding confusing getting more confused throwing up is part of the path why then alone the mind will give up otherwise the mind never gives up when the mind gives up then the soul comes into its own then you find you are not the mind you are somebody else in this body we have the entire universe the entire creation we are carrying it with us in this great thing called the human body in this is the mind the soul the creator everything is inside this body but if you identify yourself with any one of these then you fail to recognize your reality 
when we find this body is not us and we want to find who is in us, that is us. What is the reality if this body is not? How do we check on it? How do we find out? One is kill the body and see what remains. That is the simplest way. But if you do it, you can't come and tell anyone else. Therefore, the second best thing is don't kill the body, but do the same thing as if it is killed. Simulate. Simulate death. Do you know this has been used in every path throughout the world? The process of experiencing death while living. St. Paul says, I die daily. You read that? Every discipline, every tradition, every religion says, die while living if you want to see who you are beside this body. How do you die while living? Simulate death. One of the great spiritual leaders, Raman Maharishi in India, got his entire spiritual wisdom and enlightenment when he was actually lying sick on his deathbed. And the only attendant who was giving him water and serving him food, he went away shopping. And the Swami, who became Swami later on, who was a simple man at that time, felt he was going to die. He said, oh my God, I'm going to die. Nobody's around even to give me a tumbler of water. What's going to happen? And he got afraid of dying. Then it occurred to him, why am I so afraid? What will happen after all? What will happen if I die? This body will become stiff. So he stiffened out his legs and his hand. This will become like this. My eyes will open like this. And I'll stop breathing. And he stopped breathing. He says, this is what will happen when I will die. Then who am I speaking so loudly? More living than before. If this is what I am going to die, who is speaking all this? Then thought came to him that I am more alive than ever before. When I have simulated death. And that was the beginning of his spiritual realization. That the consciousness that could assert its life, even when you simulate death, must be something other than the body.